faith, it's so important for us to stay focused on the destination. So let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the evening and night of rest that we've experienced and for the gift of greeting a new day. We thank you for your grace that renewed us while we slept, your grace that renews us and makes us new even now. Thank you for choosing us, for loving us, for teaching us to love you and to extend your love to those around us. I thank you for Bishop Park and for his leadership of this annual conference, for the amazing spirit that you pour into his life, the gifts that you've given to him. I pray that you protect he and Lisa and their family. Put a hedge around them, O oh God. And as the enemy attempts to attack, may they know that you are their protector, that nothing will prevail as they live out your call upon their lives. And for my brothers and sisters of this amazing annual conference, continue, O oh God, to give them a spirit of boldness and courage. Continue to allow them to live out the reality of who you created them to be and called them to be. And together, O oh God, Keep us focused. Keep us focused on the destination. As we look at your word now, give us ears to hear, eyes to see. Get me out of the way. Get us out of the way. Let us hear your truth. In the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus, amen. Bob was an amazing fisherman. He was one of those guys that no matter where he went fishing, he always came back with a lot of fish. People couldn't understand how Bob was always successful in his fishing excursions. Bob had a brother-in-law who was a game warden. And the game warden asked Bob one day if he could go fishing with him because the game warden was kind of curious about how Bob was always so successful. So Bob agreed, and, and one morning they met, and they went out to a lake, and they unloaded the boat, and they put it into the lake, and Bob steered the boat right to the middle of the lake. And the game warden thought, surely he's not going to try to fish here. He didn't even try to find a ledge. He didn't try to find a brush pile. He's in the middle of the lake. But sure enough, that's where Bob decided he was going to fish. And the game warden thought, well, this will be interesting. And then he noticed that Bob didn't even have a, a fishing pole. He had, he had this little bag in the boat. And all of a sudden, Bob reached in the bag and pulled out a stick of dynamite. <laughs> and he lit the dynamite and he threw it in the lake. Within a few seconds, there was a, a muffled boom, and all of a sudden, the surface of the water was filled with stunned fish. Well, you can imagine the game warden. He began to recite the fishing regulations and began to let his brother-in-law have it. And Bob just looked at his brother-in-law, didn't even hesitate. Didn't say a word, just reached back down in that bag, pulled out another stick of dynamite, lit it, threw it at Bob, at the game warden, his brother-in-law, threw it in his lap, and then said, you're going to just sit there? Or are you going to fish? Here's what I believe. I honestly believe this sometimes. I believe that God must want to scream at God's church. Are you just going to sit there? Or are you going to fish? We know our mission. We know our purpose. It's very clear. And we're reminded of it in two very familiar passages of Scripture. 
Look at these. First Matthew 28. You know it. Why don't you read it with me? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then look at this one from Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. During my time as a superintendent in the York District, I, everywhere I went, just like your superintendents do now, I repeated the mission of the church, the mission of the United Methodist Church. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ Oh, that was really bad. <laughs> Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. You know, in almost five years of saying that in every local church, I was in one church. We were doing a listening session for Matthew 28. And all of a sudden, a layman, a layman raised his hand and ask a question that no one had ever asked me before. He said, what's your definition of making disciples? I thought, I'm a superintendent. I should be able to answer this question. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit helped. And I gave him a definition that I now have continued to use. And you might not like this definition, but it works for me. I said to him, I believe making disciples is helping those who are already here in the church go deeper in their faith of God. And it's doing whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to make certain that at least one more person has a chance to know Jesus. To me, that's the, that's the simple truth of what it means to make disciples of Jesus Christ. It's our only reason for existence. The only reason we exist as the church is to help people go deeper in their relationship with God and to make sure that at least one more person has a chance to know the life, the love, the hope, the joy, the peace, the significance that comes in a relationship with Jesus the Christ. The church is not a building. It's not a place for social gatherings. It's not a place where clergy, choirs, and praise teams perform. The church isn't a stage for weddings, baptisms, and funerals. It isn't a group therapy session or a positive thinking rally. The church is not even a theological training center or a distribution center for programs and strategies. The church is a collection of people who have a faith and trust in Jesus Christ and a passion for others to have the same. Now, now listen, all the things that I mentioned that the church is not are things that happen within the church. They are things that must happen within the church. They are positive activities. But the church cannot be defined by any of those. And the church will not be developed by any of those. The church is the people who believe in Jesus Christ gathered together so that they can go into the lives of their friends, families, neighbors, co-workers, and yes, even enemies, 
and share how Jesus has made them different. How Jesus is the hope of the world. How Jesus and only Jesus can offer the significance, purpose, meaning, and life that I believe every single person created by God is looking for. The mission of the church, the purpose of the church, is not just a nice saying that we memorize and then speak loud every time we gather. When I arrived in the Upper New York Annual Conference and began to to work with those amazing people of God in that place, they had a great mission statement and a vision statement. And as I began to look at it, I started, once I got a little more comfortable, I started asking questions. And one of the questions as I shared their vision statement, as I parroted it back, I then said, so what? So what? It's great to say that our vision is to live the gospel of Jesus Christ and be God's love with our neighbors in all places, but so what? How will we know when we're accomplishing our vision? How will we know when we're living the mission as God calls us to? The mission of the church, the purpose of the church is not an option. It's a command. It's not one of many choices. It is the only choice. The mission and the purpose of the church is a destination. And we need to figure out how to get there and how to get there quickly. We have to figure out how to stay focused. Because if we get unfocused, we become irrelevant. If we get unfocused, we become disobedient. And friends, irrelevance and disobedience have eternal consequences. We've got to stay focused on the destination, the mission, the purpose of the church. If we don't, we become irrelevant. We become disobedient. And it has eternal consequences. So how do we stay focused on the destination? Well, just a couple thoughts. First, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, you know it. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, I know what you're thinking I know you're sitting there thinking, come on, Mark, is this all you got? (laughs) Tell us something new, something we don't already know. Give us something profound. Well, I'm convinced that our inability sometimes to truly live the mission isn't because we are unwilling to try something new but rather it's because of our willingness to forget what we already claim to know. This may come as a shock to some of you. And of course, this is not true in any churches in the Susquehanna Conference. (laughs) But there are churches, Christian churches, United Methodist churches all around the country that are doing things that have nothing to do with Jesus. There are churches filled with good-meaning people who have made the mission of the church about meeting their needs, accomplishing their agenda, keeping things the way they like them. And most of the time, it has very little to do with Jesus. 
Some of you may have read the Barna study that was released in March that identified religiosity in the metro area of the United States. In that study, Barna found that throughout the United States in 2012, 40% of Americans classified themselves as very religious, saying religion is an important part of their daily life and that they attend regularly religious services every week or almost every week. 31% of Americans said that they were non-religious, that religion was not an important part of their daily life, and they seldom or never attend religious services. The remaining 29% identified themselves as moderately religious, saying that religion was important, but that they do not attend services regularly. 60% of Americans, 60% of our neighbors, co-workers, family, and friends identify themselves as either non-religious or moderately religious. For us in Upper New York, this study got very personal because the study identified a metro area in, within the bounds of the Upper New York Annual Conference, the Albany, Schenectady, Troy, metro area. Barna's study found that in that metro area, which was on the list of the top 10 least religious areas, there were 25.8% of people in that capital region who said they were very religious. 74.2% said they were moderately religious or not religious. When I shared that with folks in Upper New York, some people got mad at me. They thought I was picking on them. I was simply trying to celebrate the great opportunity we have as the church. There's work to be done. There's people who need to know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We find ourselves in one of the most challenging times to be the church. But we find ourselves in one of the most exciting times to be the church. Despite how people identify and define themselves, this is what I believe about the human condition. We are looking for significance and purpose. We desire hope and healing We want to live lives that matter, lives that are abundant. We have within us a desire for the eternal. And church, may we never forget that we claim and proclaim the very truth the world around us desires and seeks. We claim and proclaim Jesus. Jesus, the one, the only one who can offer true significance, true hope, true healing, true life. Yeah, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus if we're going to stay focused on the destination because Jesus is the destination. Jesus is the mission and the purpose. We also have to not only keep our eyes on Jesus, but we've got to choose the best path if we're going to stay focused on the destination. How many of you, like me, have a love-hate relationship with your GPS? (laughs) I thought that I found a way to permanently shut the volume off on my GPS. But that thing is so much smarter than me that when I should be hearing that annoying word, recalculating, (laughs) that's always said with attitude. (laughs) I think it automatically turns the volume on, so I have to listen to it. Uh, But GPSs, whether they're, they're the ones we have in our car or a navigation system on our phone, as much as Perhaps we curse them. They're also a great blessing in our lives. 
and, and they have settings that will help you to choose the best path based on where you're going and, and how you want to get there. For example, you can choose whether or not you want to take toll roads. You can choose whether or not you want to go uh, the fastest way or the shortest way. They're not always the same, right? Just like the settings on a GPS, we in the church have to be willing to, to choose the best path for us to live the mission. The mission is the same. The mission doesn't change. From church to church, from annual conference to annual conference, from Christian to Christian. But the way in which we accomplish the mission must be different. It can't be the same in every place. We've got to choose the best path. That's why I hope you value and celebrate the leadership of the Susquehanna Annual Conference. And I hope you stay committed to recent decisions that you've made together about the path that you're going to take to live the mission. When the Susquehanna Conference was born, it was done so with a clear sense of our purpose, a clear sense of the mission. And you adopted a mission statement that is articulate and purposeful. Look at it. Hopefully you know this. You said that your mission statement is to, part of it is to train and deploy quality transformational clergy and lay leadership to lead the disciple-making process in the local churches. You also said that we believe part of our mission is to resource our local churches with effective tools and best practices for effective disciple-making in the 21st century and the reformation of the church. And you said part of our mission is to provide a covenantal connection for ministry and mission beyond the local church. And over the past three years, you've made some bold decisions. And you're living out those bold decisions so that the mission can be lived fully. I want you to celebrate this. And I want you to recognize all that God has accomplished in you and through you. Look at some of the things that you've chosen to do and have begun to implement in your life together. You made a commitment to the revitalization of existing congregations through strategies like Matthew 28, the Small Church Initiative, Five Faithful Practices of Fruitful Congregations, you engaged in a partnership with the Path One Initiative to create new places for new people. You agreed to the realignment and reduction of districts, not to save money, but based on mission, so that the role of the DS could become one of equipper and coach and teacher and less one of conflict manager and firefighter. You gave permission for your superintendents to spend more time in places of health, walking alongside those pastors and laity and congregations who are committed to living the mission. You agreed to the creation of a full-time director of congregational development. You made the decision to realign your conference structure, to direct resources toward the equipping and powering of local churches, because that's where disciples of Jesus Christ are made. Annual conferences don't make disciples. Districts don't make disciples. Local churches being used by the power of God's Spirit make disciples. You created focused ministry teams specifically aimed at resourcing local churches to accomplish the mission. You created the position of director of volunteers and mission to provide opportunities for people to engage in mission and outreach opportunities. You've created an environment of accountability and expectation for local churches to be vital 
This is what you've done in the last three years. Imagine what God will do in you and through you in the next three years. All of that, my friends, was born out of your desire to stay focused on the destination, to keep the mission the main thing, the only thing. And while there's been spirited debate and conversations about some of the details of those decisions, the reality is these decisions and these steps that you've taken provide a greater way for individuals and local congregations to discover the best path, to choose the best path for living out the mission and arriving at the destination. God's doing amazing things through the people of the United Methodist Church in the Susquehanna Conference. Because of your faithfulness to the mission, lives are being changed for Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. But there are greater things yet to be experienced. I try to use statistics very carefully because when we look at statistics, we can quickly fall into a mindset of defeat and hopelessness. But we also need to understand where we're at. We need to know the picture of reality so we can be open to God's Spirit and taking us to where we have been called. So I looked at your 2012 statistics compared to 2011. And here's, a, here's some of what I found. The number of young adults and adults in Christian formation groups increased by 1% in 2012 over 2011. The number of persons served by community ministries for outreach justice and mercy increased by 13% in one year. Total membership has decreased by 2% in the last year. The number of people received by profession of faith, new disciples of Jesus Christ, has decreased by 4%. Average worship attendance has decreased by 2%. Number of persons baptized all ages, has decreased by 8%. Number of youth in Christian formation groups has decreased by 2%. Sunday school attendance has decreased by 5%. Now, I want you to hear this. Please hear this. Compared to other annual conferences, those numbers aren't bad. The decline is not as great but here's the truth. The church of Jesus Christ is meant for growth, not decline. You are poised to lead, to lead the denomination. You are poised to lead the United Methodist Church in creating growing, healthy, and vital congregations. But you've got to be willing to keep doing the hard work of choosing the right path that will allow you to accomplish the mission. And for many, that means you need to keep doing what you're doing. Press on. For others, it means that you might need to make a major shift and how you live, and how you go after the purpose. And for others, for some, it's recognizing that it may be time to celebrate the ministry that was and now focus on creating a legacy that will allow a new ministry to be birthed and that could never happen by holding on or simply trying to survive. To stay focused on the destination, to stay focused on the mission, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to choose the right path. And here's the last one. We've got to allow God's heart to become our heart. You see, it's full circle. <laughs> We're right back to where we started 
yesterday. Without a heart captured and transformed by God, we will not have the stuff that will allow us to stay focused on the destination. There are too many distractions, too many excuses. The mission that we have been called to is a mission of the heart, God's heart. Jesus came for one reason and one reason only, because God so loved the world. The mission will never, ever be neglected by God. The mission will never be hijacked, and we will never lose focus on the destination if we experience in every moment of every day our heart colliding with the heart of God. Someone who has become a dear friend, Bishop Gary Mueller, posted a prayer on Facebook a few months ago. And I wanted to share the words of that prayer with you. He prayed, Lord, my life is a journey filled with all kinds of experiences, with things I never imagined possible, but they were. With things I prayed never would happen, but they did. You've helped me realize something about this journey. It's more than just experiences, events, and what happens. It's actually a journey into your heart. And the truly amazing thing is how you helped me get there. You love me just as I am with no ifs, ands, or buts. You reach out and fill me to overflowing with your unconditional love. You shape, mold, and transform me through your amazing grace and you never give up on me. So Lord, regardless of where I go and what I do today, help me make sure you're always my destination. Brothers and sisters, the mission's clear. The destination is before us. We need to stay focused. And that focus happens as we again understand the depth of God's grace for us. And as we understand the depth of God's grace for us, we then become vehicles and vessels by which the grace of God is extended to those around us. If we're going to live the mission, we've got to be amazed by the grace of God. We've got to be amazed. So I want to leave you with a video that has been a gift to me, and I have used it probably way too many times. But it really is what it's about. If we're going to live the mission, we've got to be amazed. And from that amazement, God will do amazing things in each of us. So watch this video. Would you express your appreciation for the gift that we have received in and through our beloved Bishop, Bishop Webb.